Now, uh, before we begin today's program, I would like to say a few words about our new center, what our mission is, uh, and what we're hoping to achieve. The, D the Center for Design, Law, and Technology, or C-Delta for short, is about bringing together people from business, design, and the law communities in order to better understand the issues designers, businesses, and lawyers face in design, including whether to seek legal protection of design, but extending to issues well beyond the purely legal ones. Now, as you see, the logo for our center, which has a Greek delta symbol or triangle, symbolizes these three connections tying together design, law, and technology or business. And our mission is to make our center reflect what, is, what good design is all about. Uh, after all, as the renowned photographer Platon said, design is about connection. It is about how do you make this reach people. Uh, we want C Delta to reach people outside this building and outside the law. And we're so very happy to see and also to receive uh, email supports from uh, people outside of the law. Uh, including uh, representatives from our, ins our very own Institute of Design, which is a part of our building, uh, as well as designers from sh Chicago, uh, as well as uh, people from businesses in Chicago uh, who have an interest in design. Now, the launch of our center coincides with the return of Professor Graham Dinwiddie, our featured speaker, uh, back to Chicago Kent as the Global Professor of Intellectual Property Law. Before his re return to Chicago Kent, Professor Dinwiddie held the IP chair at Oxford University. Professor Dinwiddie is one of the leading experts in design law, not just in the United States, but around the world. He is a co-author of a casebook on design law, and he has written and lectured extensively on design protection internationally. Uh, he and I are co-founders of this new center, and I could not be more excited about teaming up with Graham on this incredibly ex exciting uh, endeavor. And Professor Dinwiddie will speak on the topic of the future of design copyright after Star Athletica, question mark. Then we will have a reply brief, uh, reply, excuse me, not brief, but reply. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to write, you don't need to write a brief. We'll have a reply from Professor Mark McKenna, uh, Notre Dame professor of law and a pres presidential fellow at Notre Dame University, who is also a research affiliate of our design center. Professor McKenna is a co-author of the only other design law casebook in the United States, of which I'm honored to be a part of as well, and is one of the leading experts on design protection also in the United States and internationally. Uh, at the end of our colloquy, we hope to have time for a few questions and then celebrate the launch of our new center with a reception. So please join me in welcoming uh, first Professor Dinwiddie to uh, deliver the address. I'm gonna talk about uh, what is, I think in many respects, a, uh, a controversial copyright design case. Uh, but it's interesting to put it in context. Um, I got first interested in intellectual property because a completely wacky decision of the British House of Lords in 1986 uh, in which uh, the drawing of an exhaust pipe of a car was held to give rights, uh, exclusive rights and the ability to make that exhaust pipe for British Leyland, which was worth about 800 million pounds at the time in that particular market. Um, the House of Lords eventually rejected and reversed that decision um, because they don't have a provision that US law has that I'll talk about. Um, and it resulted in legislation within 18 months to reverse what was seen as some of this crazy principle. So although some of the Star Athletica is seen to be a crazy case by some people, I guarantee it was not as crazy um, as uh, where I started in design. Um, I'm, what I'm going to do is, I know we've got a bunch of design gurus here uh, who I want to make sure we get it uh, here from in the Q&A, but I'm going to do a little bit of background so we're all um, on the same page by going through a little bit of the uh, lead up to Star Athletica, uh, talk mostly about the case itself, and then actually turn uh, to the implications both uh, in the courts um, and in Congress. So let's start. These um, are the, 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 the designs that are issued in Star Athletica. We know that copyright protects artistic expression. Uh, 
It doesn't, however, protect uh, utility. But sometimes useful articles actually have artistic uh, components to them. So the question always is, how do we separate the artistic expression from the utility? How do we protect one but not the other? So to put it in the context uh, of this particular case, how do you protect the artistic aspects of the cheerleader uniforms without also protecting the utility? Um, or to use an example that I think is a little less controversial in terms of the understanding of the functions of product, and this is a case I'll come back to you, how do you protect the artistic aspects of these belt buckles without also incidentally protecting the utility? Because we know from the statute that the design of a useful article can in fact be protected. The question is under what circumstances? Well, the 1976 Act actually gives us uh, the answer to the uh, question of what the circumstances are, and that is the separability test. Um, so the question really is, is are the arrangements of the uh, chevrons and lines and colors in the cheerleader uniform, are they separable from the function of the cheerleader uniform? And that is the central question um, that uh, is uh, at issue in Star Athletica. Right, so that's the statutory language, but I've got to just make one little bit modification in order to understand what's going on in these cases, which is the statute appears to talk literally in terms of physical separation and independent existence, but in fact, uh, the legislative history makes very clear that um, you can get protection if the artistic features are not only physically separable, but if they are what the legislative history called conceptually separable uh, from uh, the utilitarian features. And to illustrate that, I'm going to use an example that Justice Breyer used in uh, the Star Athletica case itself. Uh, so if you look on the left, these are both rather ugly looking lamps uh, involving cats, uh, but the one on the left um, you can see you could actually take the cat off the lamp and the cat and you could physically separate them and you could see the cat standing or sitting uh, uh, on its own. That's harder to do physically if you try to do that with the one on the right where the rod going up to the light actually goes through the cat, you would destroy both the lamp and the cat. But you can imagine and therefore you can conceive of the lamp, the cat as a separate uh, piece of sculpture that is conceptual separability, and we've long recognized that both forms of separability uh, will satisfy the statutory test. The test of separability uh, can be traced to this case, another lamp case, Mazur and Stein in 1954, uh, which is an, uh, actually under the 1909 Act, but it's an attempt to register um, as a work of art uh, a lamp base um, that was intended to be used as a lamp base. A statuette tended to be used as a lamp base, but the copyright registration actually claimed it um, as a work of art. And the defendant's argument in this case um, was that if something was intended to be used in a utilitarian or industrial context, then in fact it could not be a candidate for copyright protection. And the Supreme Court by 72 rejected uh, that argument, said you could uh, conceive of the, um, uh, uh, the lamp base as a statue, uh, as a piece of art, and as a result, it was protectable by copyright. And in its strong form, what that is, is an endorsement of a European concept, particularly in French and Belgian law, um, of unity of art. <clears throat> um, that the functional nature of something does not make it any less artistic. In the context of doing that, the Copyright Office regulation, uh, which had come up with the language of separability, uh, was essentially endorsed by the Supreme Court. And then the 76 Act language that we're now dealing with uh, was then embedded um, in Section 101 um, of the Copyright Act. So that's how we got uh, this. Um, what I thought I'd do is just very briefly look at the application by the lower courts and then turn to Star Athletica because it's good to get a sense of the alternative tests that were out there, um, which might make, um, at least put Justice Thomas's efforts in context. Um, so again, just to remind you, there's the statutory test. Can we identify artistic, um, pictorial, graphic, sculptural to be completely accurate, artistic features separately from um, the utilitarian aspects, and can they exist independently um, of uh, those aspects? All right, so a couple of lower court cases. So this is one I mentioned earlier with the belt buckle, Kaiserstein Court, um, which is a second circuit decision in which the belt buckle designed by Barry Kaiserstein Court uh, was protected by copyright because the ornamental features, the artistic features, were said by the second circuit to be the primary aspects uh, rather than the utilitarian function uh, holding the belt, uh, the, the trousers up, which in fact was subsidiary. Um, uh, 
the reasoning behind what was primary and what was subsidiary was not particularly uh, stellarly clear. Um, and in fact, uh, there's at least some suspicion that uh, this was seen as a work of art in large part because the MoMA had the belt buckle in their permanent collection. Uh, which the um, author and plaintiff had kindly donated to them before that issue came up in the, uh, in the litigation. Um, so primary and subsidiary was one possible test. The second one is this one, which is a, a famous case, Brandier. Um, this is the, uh, the ribbon rack. You, it, you put your bikes in there uh, and lock them up to stop them getting uh, stolen. Uh, this came about because the fellow had made a sculpture, uh, a piece of modern art, and um, was sitting at home one day and it's sitting in the corner and one friend came over and said, that'd be a pretty good bike rack. Uh, the highest compliment you can pay a sculptor. A and he duly uh, took the, uh, the bike rack and he, he stretched the, the sizing a little bit so the bikes would fit in and that actually turned out to be fatal uh, to the copyrightability because what the court said was that the design therefore had been influenced largely by functional considerations. If he just take the sculpture and used it as a bike rack, he would have been fine. Um, but by making the modifications, um, uh, he had been influenced too much by functional considerations and we didn't have separability. And uh, Judge Oaks, in a, a slight ironic passage, uh, commented that he had achieved the highest goals of uh, modern industrial design with the harmonious fusion of form and function and thus he was getting no copyright. Um, next case, uh, which I think is maybe the one that's getting closest to the Supreme Court in some ways, these are mannequins. We've had a surprisingly large number of mannequin cases. Uh, this is not the only mannequin case. In this case, the mannequins were found to be unprotectable, and there were a couple of different tests that were articulated by uh, the Second Circuit. So uh, uh, Judge Mansfield uh, came up with the uh, test of whether or not the features were wholly unnecessary to the function um, uh, to, of the article. Um, and Judge Newman, in what I think is probably the most thoughtful opinion, uh, I've seen on this over the years, uh, uh, came up and whether, asked the question whether or not whether the artistic aspects of the useful article stimulate in the mind of a whole or a concept that is separate from the concept evoked by its utilitarian function. All right. um, that was known as the displacement test, but you couldn't, the, the, the important point of that was you didn't hold them simultaneously. So you had to look at a chair, for example, and say, can I look at that chair as a piece of sculpture without thinking of it as a chair? That was essentially the question. Now you can see these are all very metaphysical and somewhat uh, amorphous tests. Um, but these were not the only tests. By the time the case gets to the Supreme Court, there are, depending on how you count them, nine or ten tests in the appellate courts and in the scholarly literature, which the Sixth Circuit actually set out very helpfully uh, in the majority opinion. So let's talk a little bit about Star Athletica. Um, so Varsity, who's the plaintiff in this case, uh, actually has more than 200 copyright registrations. These are the five that actually are issued in the case. Uh, Justice Thomas, in the uh, opinion of the court, described them as primarily a combination of uh, uh, combinations, positionings, and arrangement of elements, including chevrons, lines, and colors. All right? So that's what we're talking about. Um, are the artistic features of these things separable uh, from the function of a cheerleading uh, outfit? Oh, well, the district court didn't think they were. Um, uh, because uh, they were defined as the function was the, that was, they were to serve was to be a cheerleading uniform and you could not uh, separate that from the particular configurations that were at issue. The Sixth Circuit in a two to one decision um, found they were in fact uh, separable. Um, uh, they were separately identif identifiable because you could put them side by side, one without the designs and one with the designs and you could see that both were cheerleading uniforms. Um, in that respect, they took on board, I think, the advice of the Copyright Office Compendium, which has suggested that was a, an important uh, consideration. Um, they said there were lots of other ways you could have cheerleading outfits, so clearly they said they were separately identifiable, viable as uh, artistic aspects. And they were capable of existing independently, they said, because you could, as indeed the plaintiff had done, you could replicate the artistic chevrons or what have you um, on other designs and you could, and this is the one that probably opens the door to the floodgates, uh, you could also probably frame them uh, and put them in a piece of art, right? Take the, the chevrons and designs and actually have it um, as a painting or a piece of graphic art. So it goes up to the Supreme Court from the Sixth Circuit and the Supreme Court affirms and just to, to reinforce this, we have two tests in theory uh, we probably are down to one, I think, re realistically, as I'll point out. But essentially, you've got to look at separate identification and independent in existence. So Justice Thomas 
wrote an opinion for the court, um, uh, five judges, um, with Judge uh, Justice Ginsburg concurring in the judgment, but not the opinion. And his test, I think it's fair to say, barely restated the statute. All right, so he said basically, can the design feature be perceived as a work of art, separate from useful article? Um, and would the design feature qualify as a protectable artistic work? And this next part is probably the most important, again, either on its own or fixed in other, some other tangible medium of expression. So for example, a painting, a canvas. If it were imagined separately um, from the useful article into which it's incorporated. Right? So that is now clearly the test uh, that we have uh, for uh, design copyright. Um, before I go on to analyze that and the dissent, I, I think it's interesting to look at uh, what is a very short concurrence by uh, Justice Ginsburg, but she argued that in fact you shouldn't even be talking about the separability test because she said this is not actually the design of a useful article, design of a cheerleading outfit. This actually it is design that has been replicated, reproduced on useful articles. So it's an abstract uh, a graphic design that you can print on anything. They happen to have printed it um, on um, the uh, on the cheerleading outfit. Um, uh, Justice Thomas rejected that because he said the separability requirement applies to uh, graphic works as well as, uh, as sculptural works, um, um, and therefore is inconsistent with the text. But I actually think this is very close to where we actually might be in terms of the result, um, because one other articulation the plaintiff had put forward of that is not that there was no separability that had to be applied in the case of a graphic work, but it is that it essentially uh, when you're talking about a two-dimensional graphic work, you almost have per se separability when it's reproduced um, uh, in other dimensions. And I think when you look at the test that Justice Thomas came up with, I think we're very close to it. So it's a very short concurring judgment, but it's an interesting question which maybe we can discuss is the, whether we're actually there. Um, in terms of uh, how he applied that, he said uh, the separate identification requirement was not onerous. You simply look at it. Can you see the artistic elements, which is pretty easy. Um, and the one that is ordinarily more difficult to satisfy, and I suggest this is actually where we uh, are, um, uh, is the independent existence. His reasoning is entirely based on the language. He said the language of the statute is clear, which is, a, I think, a brave thing to say when you have nine or 10 tests at the appellate courts uh, trying to interpret the language, but uh, that's Justice Thomas for you. Um, he did reassure us that he wasn't looking for the best copyright policy, and certainly the critics so far think he's held true to that reassurance, I think, uh, in what he's come up with. So in applying it here, uh, he said it's easy to identify the decorations um, as having artistic elements, um, and there is independent existence, a little bit consistent, I think, with the Sixth Circuit, because uh, you could actually separate the chevrons, the lines, what have you, uh, and apply them in other mediums, such as on a canvas. Now, what is interesting is that uh, Justice Breyer and Justice Kennedy, uh, Justice Breyer's the opinion, Kennedy went also dissented, um, essentially bought into most of the same test. Um, it's just that they actually would have come to a different conclusion when applying the test. Um, there's maybe a little bit of light between them, which we'll get to in a second. Um, Essentially what Justice Breyer said is you could not actually try to imagine the, the artistic elements without realizing you're still looking um, at a cheerleading uniform. That's to say, and this actually brings up a phrase, I think it was, it was in Mark's uh, amicus brief, essentially you would bring the design of the useful article along with the artistic elements when you engaged in uh, that process um, of imagination, all right? Um, um, Therefore, uh, Justice Breyer said um, uh, uh, they were not, did not have an independent existence. Whether Justice Thomas actually thinks that's part of the test is not clear to me. Um, he did use the language of replication a couple of times in the opinion. Um, and uh, in the end of the day, he engages with Justice Breyer on whether you would necessarily replicate the features. And he thinks the answer to that would be no, because there were other, design, other garments to which you could and to which the plaintiff had actually uh, applied uh, the artistic elements. Um, there's other places where he seems to think replication is not actually part of the test. So he actually suggests that if you engaged in what Justice Breyer was trying to engage in, um, you would make uh, or render uncopyrightable uh, a series of works that we regard um, probably as copyrightable by conventional wisdom, such as designs etched into the shape um, of particular items um, such as guitars. So I think it's an open question is whether the replication point is actually part um, of uh, uh, Justice Thomas' test, but they both apply a test 
pretty similarly, and six of them say protectable and two say non-protectable, and that should probably give us a warning about how easy it will be to apply this test when they all apply the same test and they come out a slightly different way. So what is driving Justice Breyer? Um, I think what's driving him is, is that the imagination test, particularly with respect um, to two-dimensional works of art, probably has no limit. It's very hard to think of an artistic design that if you couldn't stick a frame around the graphic design, uh, you couldn't think of it as art. So he's concerned, I think, about the lack of limits, at least in this doctrine. Um, and we'll suggest in a minute there are other doctrines that might actually provide uh, the limits. The other thing that he's uh, that was driving him, which is something you've seen in uh, several of uh, Justice Breyer's opinions in IP, is he's concerned about the intellectual property system as a whole. Um, and in particular, he pointed to the fact um, that if you had uh, a design that perfectly integrated and realized the highest forms of industrial design, um, you would be able to get a design protection for what is now 15 years, uh, citing again Mark and Kathy Strandberg's paper. Um, but of course, um, that's a different form of intellectual property protection. Right? Copyright is, 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 is life plus 70. If we have a system that's meant to protect design, it's design patent, he said. All right, so that's where we are. Uh, let's say we talk about a little bit about the implications. And I'll split this up into, first of all, the courts and then Congress. Uh, so let me say a few things about litigating these tests. Um, uh, it, it strikes me as a, a judgment that w one would expect from a civil law court, not a common law court, which is I've read the statute and the statute is what the statute says. Um, uh, it doesn't really give a tremendous amount of guidance, um, I think, uh, to lawyer courts. Um, it does rule out some considerations, which I'll mention in a minute. But actually, I think most of the tests that were in the lower courts are not definitively ruled out as relevant um, post Star Athletic. And in particular, most courts used a variety of the tests, sort of hybrids. They sort of picked, cherry picked different parts from the different tests to work out whether uh, something um, was protectable. And I think you're still going to see some of that. It's, it will now be framed with, by Justice Thomas's test, but Justice Thomas's test is not that much different from the statute, um, um, which is what they were doing so in the first place. Um, it may be so liberal, and this picks up on, I think, Justice Breyer's first concern, at the threshold that we will now see litigation on a variety of other doctrinal fronts. Um, and uh, I'll come to what those are in a minute. Um, I don't think that's necessarily bad, because I don't think there is a more incoherent set of case law out there probably in copyright than separability. Um, and so much, it's so bad, even in 1990, so we've had 28 years of, of, of um, even more machinations, uh, the Architectural Works Copyright Protection Act, which had to deal with the same issue of separating artistic features of building from functional, um, uh, Congress explicitly said, we probably should apply the separability test, but since we don't know what the hell's happening with that, uh, we will come up with a completely different test of dictated by function. Um, and I think they were probably right uh, 28 years ago about the certainty that came out, of, came out of it. What I think we may see is effectively is a rule close to the concurring rule uh, of Justice Ginsburg regarding 2D designs. And again, the question I'd ask is, I'm not sure that's bad, uh, because we were probably quite close to that already under the case law. All right, so what's not relevant? So this part at least is sort of, I guess, shrinking to some extent the, um, uh, the test that might actually be litigated. Well, clearly, uh, what's left after you remove the artistic features is not a consideration that you need to engage in. This is, was driven from the uh, dissent in the pivot point case, which is another mannequin case, uh, and to some extent from Paul Goldstein's uh, treatise. Um, and, but uh, Justice Thomas rejected it, um, saying simply looking at the language of the statute, um, if you have to look at what is left, uh, you are looking at something the statute doesn't ask you to look at. And moreover, he thinks that the Mazur uh, uh, lamp would fail that test. Um, and I think that's important. He seems to think that compliance with Mazur um, is one of the metrics that he's going to drive, that's driving him, and I'll come back to that in a second. Secondly, um, there are a couple of tests drawn quite explicitly from the case law um, that uh, are rejected. And so you can take them off these off the list. Um, so Brandier, which is the ribbon rack case, uh, the artistic judgment and the influences on the designer. Um, are, uh, are now uh, taken, um, are now forbidden to be the, the test. And I think that's probably a good thing, uh, both for the difficulty um, of proving it um, and uh, uh, also for the, the, the reference to the statutory language. Uh, whether or not the features will be marketable without utilitarian function, also rejected, that's drawn um, um, from another case involving um, uh, costumes, the Galliano case. Uh, and again, I think uh, 
that's probably helpful uh, to remove that from the debate. Uh, and in that respect, the, the Thomas opinion, I think, uh, essentially endorsed Judge Moore's majority opinion in the, second, in the Sixth Circuit, which certainly was not unwilling to put a lot of emphasis on the Brandier test and was willing, unwilling to put uh, any emphasis on the marketability test. All right? So we've, they've, they've narrowed some of the debate. Is it helpful in any other ways? Well, this one is actually, uh, I think, uh, an interesting point because it's the only point where, um, well, Mark may disagree with this, it's one point where Justice Thomas moves away from the statute and it's where he may have been most useful, <laughs> uh, which he wouldn't find a compliment perhaps, but I think it is true, which is um, one of the big debates of the Sixth Circuit was exactly what is the function of the article depicted in the, in the uh, copyright registration. Um, so basically, the majority said it's basically athletic wear, and so therefore it has to be something you can jump up and down and kick and cheer in. Um, whereas the dissent said the function is actually to present yourself as a cheerleader. It's a cheerleader's uniform. And in fact, Judge McKeegan dissent said once you defend that, that is the function of that article, then pretty much the case solves itself because you can't have a cheerleader uniform that doesn't have these kind of uh, features in them, all right? Um, and that itself, Judge McKeek had uh, a Second Circuit case, uh, uh, Giovanni, that I think supported him in that. Interestingly, when Justice Thomas basically restates the statute, he makes one little tweak. He's, he moves away from comparing whether you can imagine it separately from utilitarian aspects to whether you can uh, imagine it separately uh, from the useful article. So it takes away from us this pretty uh, metaphysical debate about what is the function of an article. And you can see several cases in which that has been uh, uh, important. So I think that may be helpful, though unintentional, perhaps, on his part. Um, in terms of other things that you'll see litigated, um, I think you're going to see uh, heavy use on Maser, which is every test you come up with, would Maser fail this? Would Maser pass this? Um, and that is a certainly ironic because the court properly says that separability got its roots in Maser. But actually, if you read the literature, particularly Jerry Reichman's 1983, 180-page piece or whatever it was on, on the history of, of design, and, and um, I think even if you look back at some of the case law in that time, the Copyright Office was continually trying to pull back from a broad reading of Maser um, to something that it thought a little bit less European and less uh, driven by the unity of art, and the separability rule might be thought actually as a very narrow reading of Maser rather than the broad unity of art. But he seems to think consistency with Maser is one of the ways you would test the legitimacy of a particular um, uh, outcome. The second uh, point that I think is interesting is the way he connects, and this is something Jane Ginsburg had written about both before and has written after um, in the case, um, has connected section 113A which gives um, the right uh, of a corporate owner to control reproduction of a useful article connected that to the separability doctrine as if to say it doesn't matter whether you create first in the useful article or whether you create outside the useful article and apply it to the useful article. You should, your protection should not uh, 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 depend on what Jane called the birth order distinction of uh, which comes uh, which comes first. And I think that's interesting and it connects to something Mark Mayer might talk about, I'm not sure, which on claiming, because claiming becomes less relevant, I think, uh, if the birth order probably comes up. Uh, in terms of broader implications, well, I mentioned that I expect some movement towards other doctrines. Uh, interestingly, everyone said, oh, they got copyright in their cheerleader's uniform. They didn't. All that they got was a judgment of the Supreme Court saying um, they had separable aspects. Uh, it technically was remanded uh, uh, to dis determine other issues, and in particular, it's plausible you make, make the argument that there was no originality in the particular design of cheerleading outfit that had chevrons on it. Um, and in fact, the court in all the justices, uh, Ginsburg and Thomas in particular, said we're not deciding that issue. Uh, in fact, Justice Breyer, I think, actually said in dicta they were plainly unoriginal. Um, the defendant wished to go on and challenge that, but the insurer decided to settle the case, so we're not going to get a decision on that. But uh, I wouldn't take it as uh, uh, definitive that, in fact, these were protectable. They were just separable. So I think you're going to see a lot of debate on the originality threshold, about how far that can go up, and sort of relatedly on the ID express and merger doctrine. If there only are so many ways uh, to actually uh, produce uh, the cheerleading outfit, um, have we got some sort of uh, merger of idea and expression? Second set of broader implications is we'll see a move towards scope. So something which I, I'm pretty sure Mark will agree on that surprisingly absent from 
uh, some of the discussion is section 113B, which if you actually read makes very little sense. It basically said the law doesn't change when we enacted the 1976 Act from the protection that existed before. So what was that, that protected, protection that existed before? It was protection, uh, uh, it was a restriction of protection that said if you have a drawing of a useful article, so it's still a graphic work, an artistic work, drawing the work doesn't get you um, copyright in the item, in the functional useful article. And this is actually the rule that was missing in British law that, uh, that got me into intellectual property in the first place because they drew the exhaust pipe, they got a copyright in the exhaust pipe, right, because it was a reproduction. Um, that is not the case under US law, that's clear. And in fact, all the opinions uh, uh, show that. So actually, uh, Justice Breyer, who's very good with his appendices, in his opinion, uh, it renders this picture of Van Gogh and says basically he gets a copyright um, in the picture, but he doesn't get a copyright in the shoe. All right, that's a pretty easy application of it. Uh, and in fact, uh, Justice Thomas, in his opinion, agrees that using, interestingly, um, a three-dimensional replica, which is not the normal thought that goes into 113B, but uh, a three-dimensional replica saying that doesn't get you control of the truck. And this is where I think they probably disagree, which is that uh, Thomas quite clearly says, you're not going to get, by protecting the surface decoration, uh, any protection in the sort of the three-dimensional shape and design and configuration um, of the uh, cheerleading outfit. And I think, essentially, Breyer is suspicious that is what you're going to get uh, through from this particular case. So they agree again on the application of the rule, on the rule, but perhaps of a disagreement on the application. All right, two last thoughts. Um, uh, one is, uh, in academic terms, uh, what does this tell us about um, the different policy levers by which we might get the right balance in intellectual property? Um, this is something that you will find in all the different intellectual property regimes. Do you something, deal with these issues as a matter of threshold? You can't get a copyright. Do you deal with the matter of scope, which is 113B, or infringement, or defenses for particular uses? Um, do you use blanket rules? Um, uh, do you use more case sensitive standards? We have lots of these in copyright. Um, my preference, which Mark I think may disagree with, is to deal with these on the back end a little bit in terms of scope. I know he may have uh, 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 different views on the viability of that. But I think that's part of the debate that's going on in this area. So one counter thought, um, uh, which is to say it didn't really decide very much. All right, uh, and so the point here is this was a horrible case to take. Uh, it was a horrible case to take because, in fact, most of the hard cases involve sculptural um, designs, three-dimensional designs. And this, at least as it was read by the majority, was a case about two-dimensional graphic designs. Those have, on the whole, been the easy cases. All right? So the Supreme Court has tried to come up with a solution um, uh, using an easy case that's applicable to hard cases, and therefore it's possible you might see distinctions uh, being drawn on that basis. Last thought uh, in the last 30 seconds that I have um, is uh, legislatively any changes. Well, the problem of design patents, which is what um, uh, Justice Breyer seems to want to rely on, is that it's not very good for particular industries uh, who might want some form of short-term short automatic protection. Copyright, of course, is an automatic protection. The problem is not short-term. Right? It's life plus 70. Um, there are models elsewhere in the world, uh, Europe and the UK, uh, have good examples that I think uh, are worth at least thinking about um, that uh, would allow some degree of very short-term automatic protection not requiring registration for particular designs. The context in which that is most significant, of course, is fashion. And this comes up in Justice Breyer's opinion. He's much more a policy person than Justice Thomas. And he what makes the point that actually there has been the ongoing debate for many, many years, decades, but whether we need separate efforts uh, to protect fashion. And he finishes with the policy point that notwithstanding all the complaints um, about the lack of protection for fashion, the fashion industry has thrived. So one legislative response might, of course, simply be to do nothing. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. So I didn't realize until I got here that I got a whole reply brief. So I've only got four pages of notes. I feel like I should filibuster a little bit and get a little more. Um, so let me just start by saying on behalf of the um, IP community, and the, especially the academic IP community, how great it is to have Graham back stateside. Um, I first met Graham actually at the Starbucks across the street when I was a young associate. Um, he's considerably older than me. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> uh, but he was already here at, at Chicago Kent teaching. And for some reason, 
uh, that I don't really know the, uh, the answer to, but I uh, am always grateful for. He just uh, decided to pay attention to me and help me figure out how to become an academic. And so uh, as I've gotten to know Graham, I've realized that that's, I I'm hardly the only one with that kind of story in our field, and he's been a great friend and mentor. Uh, having said that, um, usually my job when I follow Graham is to be more negative than he is, and in keeping with tradition, I will do that. Um, so I want to start by emphasizing something that Graham mentioned, but I think maybe deserves a little more uh, emphasis, and that is Congress's purpose, and I think this is actually pretty indisputable, its purpose in creating the separability provision was to try to distinguish applied art from industrial design. That's what Congress said it was doing. It's pretty unambiguous in the legislative history. Um, and the idea was to make applied art potentially protectable by copyright, but to exclude industrial design. I think that's important to say because Justice Thomas's methodology um, doesn't really allow him to work outward from purpose, and I think that's actually a big shortcoming of the decision. It's so bound up in text, as Graham says, that it doesn't feel like a common law decision, even though we're dealing with a su with subject matter that has lots of history and lots of sub and lots of common law. Um, so if you start from that premise that what Congress meant to do was to distinguish applied art from industrial design, <clears throat> and I think it's you have to sort of work out a little bit, why was it doing that? Well, for most of the drafting history of the 1976 Act, it seemed like Congress would also enact a form of design protection as a sort of adjunct to copyright. And that distinction between applied art and industrial design was supposed to help differentiate the forms of protection, the design protection from copyright. When the design protection didn't materialize, Congress kept the distinction in significant part to help differentiate copyright from design patents, right? Which is a, which was its acknowledged purpose. But of course, the applied art industrial design distinction was never going to be perfect, and I think that's a big part of the, the confusion in the cases. For one thing, the statute doesn't use the words applied art or industrial design, and that's a big problem, let alone attempts to define them. Um, and also, probably more significantly, even if that distinction turned out to be tractable, applied art on the one hand and industrial design on the other, it was only ever going to be partially effective in distinguishing copyright from design patent. Right? So from very early on, design patent subject matter included both surface ornamentation and overall configuration. So channeling industrial design out of copyright would roughly, but not perfectly, take care of the category of design uh, subject matter that was configuration. But that would have left complete overlap with surface ornamentation and applied art, rendering du dual protection under both of them. And I think that actually confusion might have some explanatory power <clears throat> in Star Athletica. So all that's to say that some amount of overlap between copyright and design patent was inevitable, given the distinction that, court was, that Congress was trying to design, uh, design, even if the dividing line was to be maintained between applied art and industrial design. Right. Nevertheless, I think it's really important to start from that premise that that's what Congress was doing, because the first way that the majority opinion goes astray is that it loses sight of that distinction. It loses sight of any of the reasons why we have separability. <clears throat> In particular, I think given the imperfection of the distinction, that what the court did, it erred most significantly by not working outward from the examples that Congress gave us of separability. So Graham has them, had them on one of the slides. I might back up to them. Right, so Congress uses as examples of separable subject matter a carving on the back of a chair, floral relief design on, on, on silver flatware, and it distinguishes those from the shapes of other industrial products, things like the shape of an automobile, ladies' dresses, food processors, etc. And it did that even though, and even though in many cases, those industrial products might be aesthetically satisfying. Right? So the separability question is not a question about whether there is aesthetic value, because there's aesthetic value in both applied art and industrial design. <clears throat> the Copyright Office similarly uses as, as examples an engraving on a vase, artwork on a, print, on a printed t-shirt, a colorful pattern decorating the surface of a shopping bag, a drawing on the surface of wallpaper, and a floral relief decorating the handle of a spoon. Right? Those are the examples of separable subject matter. What all of those have in common, I think, is that they treat physical separability as the core. And they treat conceptual separability as simply a coda to physical separability, by which I mean they all involve features that one could easily view as copyrightable works 
if they were physically extracted from the medium in which they happened to be fixed, say, taking the artwork off the front of a t-shirt and putting it on a poster. But it just happens that in these cases, physically extracting the designs may not be possible because it would destroy the article in the process. Right? That's what Congress was trying to do. So, so understood, industrial design differs from applied art because features of industrial design make sense only as parts of an integrated whole of the overall design. <clears throat> because the majority doesn't work outward from those examples, it ignores the possibility that some features, when viewed separately, would, in Justice Breyer's terms, necessarily bring along the underlying article. When you remove a leg from a table, it still looks like a leg of a table. <clears throat> That's a big problem because copyright's capacious originality standard, almost, under that standard, almost any feature could be imagined separately and on its own be a work. And that is a reason why I think the majority has really no satisfactory answer to Justice Breyer's invocation of Duchamp's shovel, which uh, Breyer in, in, invokes to say, look, if you take the shovel and you just put a frame around it, it's art. And uh, Justice Thomas attempts to reject that, but I don't think in any satisfactory way. Thomas says that a shovel, like a cheerleading uniform, is a useful article. So it's not copyrightable, even if a drawing of a shovel or artistic features that could be perceived as art apart from the shovel could be. One way of understanding that statement is to say that he's distinguishing between overall configuration and individual features and ruling out overall configuration. Right? But of course, the whole dispute in Star Athletica was about whether Varsity's design was of a cheerleading uniform or simply artistic features that could be perceived as art apart from the uniform. Right? In fact, the majority makes no attempt to explain its implicit conclusion that Duchamp's shovel lacked features that could be perceived as art apart from the shovel. That is to say, the court just knows separable artistic features when it sees them. Right? So the second uh, thing to say, the second challenge, I think, has to do with how to understand depictions. In dissent, Justice Breyer says, as Graham noted, uh, there's no way to look at the chevrons and stripes here and not see a cheerleading uniform. Right? The designs necessarily bring along the underlying useful article. So I, my read of the case is that Thomas actually doesn't really deny that. He says, he just rejects the whole idea that two-dimensional depictions of useful articles are uncopyrightable, even if they depict useful articles. <clears throat> right? Hence, he says at one point, the, de design, the surface design on a guitar, removed from the guitar, still doesn't replicate the guitar, and that's true even if the design conforms to the shape of the guitar. <clears throat> that way of thinking, and this might be a, attractive to Graham, <clears throat> that way of thinking might not be a problem if it were really clear that the rights in the two-dimensional depictions didn't extend to the three-dimensional useful articles embodying the design, right? or in the case of the guitar design, if the claimed features didn't have anything to do with the shape, but just the imagery that would happen to be depicted. Right? I'll say more about claiming in a minute, as Graham suggested, because it's a current obsession of mine. Right? So even though the court sort of suggested that the rights were so limited when it notes that the rights in the cardboard model of the car don't extend to the car itself, it first of all cites nothing for that proposition, not 113b, which would be the obvious site. Right? It's hard to make sense of that conclusion in light of its treatment of the guitar. Right? In fact, if you just juxtapose those two treatments, I think you would say the implicit distinction is between surface ornamentation and configuration. Design on the guitar is protectable and presumably enforceable against others that use the design even on a guitar. But the design of the cardboard model, model is protectable only as a model. Right? It can't be enforced against the actual car. So that brings me to the last point, which is claiming, and, the, and particularly the extent to which this case, I think, puts tremendous pressure on lack of methodology in copyright claiming. What's elided by the whole discussion of the, uh, of the question of whether Varsity's design consisted of surface ornamentation, design on, or cheerleading uniforms, the design of, is that that question divided the courts at every level of the litigation. In, in fact, all three of the opinions at the Supreme Court have a different take on that question. And, and I think one's view of the question is actually dispositive of the court's approach. 
So to me, at least, it hardly seems clear why the design at issue is best characterized as a two-dimensional design applied to the uniforms. Right? As Justice Breyer said, let me go, you got a lot of slides here, Graham, so I got to <laughs> go back here. As Justice Breyer said, look at the pictures. Those are cheerleading uniforms. Those are not just chevrons and lines arranged in some form. They are cheerleading uniforms. Now, it's entirely possible, these are, by the way, the deposit copies that are sent to the Copyright Office. So it's entirely possible that someone could claim less than everything that's depicted in the deposit copy. But copyright registration, of course, doesn't usually require visual demarcation or verbal elaboration. Right? So this same set of pictures could potentially reflect at least three different kinds of claims. An image of a model of a car could support a claim just to the image. Right? It could just be a picture. The same image could support a claim to the design of the model. The model would be copyrightable even if not enforceable against an actual car. Or someone could claim, I think after Star Athletica, just like Varsity did, that the images show features that might be applied to a car, at least as long as those features could be imagined apart. That might be true even if the features necessarily conform to the shape of the car. So the lack of methodology for claiming here is a big problem because the majority's test also requires us to identify features and ask if they could be imagined separately. But what features are we to imagine? If we assume that we must be talking about something less than the whole, then it's surely separate identification ought to focus on the features the plaintiff claims are separable. Otherwise, the court is just doing it on its own. It's just doing artistic evaluation. And the level of generality at which those features are described could matter a lot. If you compare the court's description, which is this very general lines and chevrons arranged in some form, to the one that, the, the, uh, the one that Varsity actually had to submit to the Copyright Office to overcome its initial uh, objection, you would see there's a radical difference. Right? The way they described to the Copyright Office included references to colors, particular locations, V shapes. It's, it's incredibly uh, specific relative to this one. And the more generally you describe features, the more they look like aspects of the platonic form of an object. Right? The more specifically you describe them, the more they look like they can be separately identified. So unless the court can give us some methodology for claiming, courts are necessarily going to be engaged in artistic evaluation, implicitly determining whether features can be sufficiently artistic to be perceived apart from the shovel, and doing that without the benefit of any claim by the parties. All right, so what are we left with? I have a few things to say. So one thing, I agree with Graham that there's two tests that I think are pretty clearly out. Right? One of which is the marketable as art test. That's pretty flatly rejected. And I also agree that the brandier sort of design process test is pretty clearly out. If I'm right that the court is best understood here as distinguishing between overall configuration and surface ornamentation, then I think what the question is going to be in lots of other cases is how often can we tell the difference? How often can we figure out which one we're actually looking at? Right? I think also um, um, one place I would probably disagree with Graham is I think actually uh, the court's failure to offer anything on the question of what is a useful article is a major problem. And I don't think it's adequate to say, let's just say that has to be separable from the useful article and not from the underlying useful aspects of the article. Because of course, if what you are talking about separating isn't separable from the useful aspects, it is itself a useful article, and it's turtles all the way down, right? So we have a serious problem, I think, there. Right, the last thing I'll say is this, is that um, I, our brief, our amicus brief, which I should say in, in full confession, um, Justice Breyer draws from pretty heavily, so I'm, I'm invested um, on that side of the case. Um, our brief concedes at one point that actually it's possible to imagine a way that this case could go forward that makes it an originality case and not a, and not a, um, a separability case if the, under, the design were understood in a very particular kind of way. I will say, though, I think there's one big risk. and I, So I think it is an accurate well, it's, it's potentially an accurate uh, prediction to say that what this is going to do is push a lot of questions to idea expression and to originality out of separability. But I think that um, what might well happen if we get that is we're going to get a very specific law of originality in the context of useful articles that is unconnected to the law of originality anywhere else in copyright. Right? And my experience with that largely in trademark law is that that's usually not a good thing. Usually getting a balkanized view that happens to apply is basically just saying we've punted all the hard questions over to something else 
we're now going to uh, answer those questions using a sort of bastardized version of a test that doesn't apply anywhere else. So uh, I will end on that largely positive note. So thanks. <laughs>